welcome to this ASEAN series event. Um, and we're going to be focusing today on Myanmar. Uh, Myanmar has been of very significant interest to the business community for some years and has sadly become even more interesting uh, since the events of February the 1st this year. The event this morning is in collaboration with our chamber member control risks and uh, IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute, which is uh, the preeminent uh, research institute on all matters Southeast Asian. Delighted to have two guest speakers, uh, Mr. Roman Kayo, uh, who joins us today from Tokyo, uh, where, we, where he's enjoying the uh, Sakura Blossom. Um, uh, Romain is an associate fellow of the Myanmar Studies Program at IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute. And he will, he will start first and, and present to you on the political situation in the country. Um, uh, Romain will be followed by Mr. John Bray, uh, Director of Control Risks. Um, and John is going to give us some perspective on um, the events uh, that have taken place since February the 1st, looking back very briefly to the 1990s and then really focusing on how the events since February the 1st this year are affecting different businesses in different ways and, and what businesses can do about the risks of doing business in Myanmar today. Um, at any time during the uh, webinar, please feel free to type in your questions in the Q&A box You'll find that in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Um, as moderator, I have one favor to ask, and that is please make your questions short and sweet. Uh, 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 try and avoid the temptation to write a paragraph or, or an essay. It makes my job much easier and it allows me to pose more questions to our speakers. So we can all get more out of their expertise and their analyses. So without further ado, I'm going to pass you over to Romain, uh, who will present first, uh, and uh, he will be followed immediately by John. Romain, it, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. And thank you to the Chamber for the invitation to present today about Myanmar. I'm actually uh, filling in for my colleague Mo Tuza, who is a co-coordinator of the Myanmar Studies Program at ICS. Uh, however, she had a conflicting uh, appointment. Um, so here I am, and uh, I'm very uh, interested about Myanmar. I've been, uh, I first lived in Myanmar in 2006. I was then an intern at the French Embassy. And I returned in 2008 and lived in uh, Myanmar, in Yangon, until uh, 2015, experiencing firsthand the uh, political reforms uh, that led to the opening of the country, uh, opening that we are now uh, seeing uh, backsliding. So my presentation today uh, will be focused on uh, the political situation um, as of now. Uh, what, why the coup, uh, what has happened since, and uh, some of the reactions by the international community. I can also address uh, reactions by the business community and what it means for investors uh, at a later stage during the Q&A session alongside John. Um, so I'll start by um, talking about the, the bloodless coup that, that took place on uh, February 1, and that really came as a surprise to uh, most observers. There had been a uh, knowledge of tensions between uh, the NLD government and the military uh, prior to the coup. However, it is my assessment that uh, very few uh, expected uh, the coup to happen. And so what happened is that uh, the the NLD leadership, including uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, President Win Mint, were rounded up. Uh, the two of them remain uh, in, on the house arrest or incarcerated at this stage, um, incommunicado. And uh, members of parliament from the NLD were also uh, rounded up. Some have been uh, released. 
other remain uh, uh, under arrest. Uh, so really, uh, you you saw the um, legitimate administration and the legitimate um, parliament being removed by force uh, by the military. And I will talk uh, later on about the why and, and the, the reason that the military has put forward for these uh, actions. So while the, uh, the, the NLD administration and, and parliament were being uh, dismantled, um, a body was formed called the State Administrative Council, SAC, which is uh, mainly composed of uh, senior military officers and led by a uh, commander in chief of the armed forces, Minong Line. However, the SAC also includes uh, representatives of um, political parties that were opposed to the NLD during the November 2020 elections. Uh, for example, the National Democratic Force um, and also members of uh, ethnic parties. So some semblance of inclusiveness in the SAC. And this uh, semblance of inclusiveness also extends to the uh, cabinet with uh, some ministers, with most ministers being uh, active military officers, but some uh, being civilians uh, brought in to the, the, the new uh, military administration. Uh, SAC has pledged that it would uh, stay in power for uh, about a year and that it would uh, be holding election within that period and that the country could then return to normal under the 2008 uh, constitution. Those were the statements uh, back in February. Uh, and one last uh, but important point about the, this bloodless coup, bloodless at the beginning, is that uh, SAC um, made it clear that it, the country remained open for business and that uh, Myanmar remained investor friendly. And one of the uh, moves to um, express this was uh, promoting uh, Ong Nain U, retired military officer, uh, well known to foreign investors uh, in Myanmar, formerly head of uh, DAICA, the investment promotion agency and then deputy minister of uh, investment and so Ong Nainu was promoted to minister after the actual minister was uh, arrested um, and uh, he, him and uh, others uh, in, in SAC and the administration expressed that Myanmar was open for business. So why this coup? Um, the, uh, the military or SAC and uh, its leader Minong Line have alleged that there was a large scale election fraud during the November 2020 elections, which the uh, NLD, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's party, uh, won resoundingly. Um, these uh, elections were not uh, fully uh, uh, free and fair. Some part of the country, including in Rakhine State, could not vote because of security reasons. However, these uh, elections were acknowledged by most, if not all, domestic and international observers as um, strong, robust enough. And so really, the, these uh, allegations of fraud put forward by the military uh, seem to have a very uh, limited, if any, basis. And um, yeah. So really, I think what is behind the coup uh, is on one hand, uh, institutional reasons, and on the other hand, personal ambitions. I'll start with the institutional reason. What we've seen on February 1 is the military institution put an end, or, or sorry, actually try to tweak the experience the experiment with democratization that it has it, it had itself started uh, with the elections in 2010. 
and under the 2008 constitution, really a framework that uh, provides um, protections to the military interest through the 25% of seats in parliament, who control over the three uh, main ministries dealing with national security, etc. But the military seems keen to retain that framework. However, it wishes to see the NLD uh, removed from uh, the political scene. And so, and this is uh, because, in my opinion, uh, the NLD winning resoundingly a second time at the polls in November 2020, following on the victory of November 2015, this signaled to the military that uh, its framework, its constitutional and political framework was going to be under increasing pressure from the inside as the NLD uh, continued to uh, rule the civilian bits of the of the government and state and uh, will try to push for more control uh, in that framework for elected uh, civilians. I think another re institutional reason uh, is that the, the NLD uh, administration from 2015 to early 2021 had tried cautiously but um, in a very uh, dedicated manner to try to address some of the structural corruption and uh, economic mismanagement that Myanmar had been facing for decades, including in a way that benefits uh, institutional and personal military interests. And so I, I think there is also, I assess there is also some uh, economic reason behind uh, this, uh, this move. Uh, beyond these institutional reasons, I, I think it's important to consider also the personal ambitions of Min Aung Line, uh, head of SAC and uh, commander in chief of the military. Min Aung Line really uh, took his position uh, in uh, 2010 replacing uh, former General uh, Tan Shui as head of the military. And so he has been uh, the, the head of the military throughout this reform process from 2010 to 2020. And um, his uh, mandate had already been extended once uh, beyond retirement age. And it was becoming clear that uh, after uh, February 1, when the uh, new elected parliament was supposed to uh, sit and then move forward towards electing a new uh, administration, it was becoming clear that uh, Minong Line would be pushed out and would have to uh, abandon his role as commander in chief and also that he was not to be granted the role of uh, president. Um, which will likely have gone to uh, again to an NLD uh, representative. So it is understood that Men Men Line felt personally threatened or pushed aside, and that beyond institutional reasons that mean uh, the military has followed him in this coup, the coup has also very personal uh, drivers. So this is what uh, happened uh, on February 1 and the background uh, to the coup. And I think uh, really the, the military and Minong line have uh, miscalculated in that they underestimated the pushback that they are now facing coming from all parts of Myanmar society. First, I mean, the, the protests, the street protests have been underestimated. Um, I think it's the comparison with uh, Thailand or Hong Kong does not uh, really hold um, because the, the protests that uh, have been taking place in Myanmar are really large in size. There were days where 
possibly hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people demonstrated throughout the country. And not only in Yangon and Mandalay, but we are talking uh, about uh, Chin State and Kachin State, uh, Tanindari region, etc. The only region being somewhat spared being uh, Rakhine State. So really large nationwide sustained protests. These protests have, of course, uh, declined in scale uh, in recent weeks following the start of a very brutal crackdown, which has led now to more than 500 deaths and more than 3,000 uh, arrests. And really, I mean, brutal, violent and brutal, because we are talking about snipers, uh, military snipers taking shots uh, at the head of uh, protesters, protest leaders. We are talking about uh, children, teenagers and children, as young as, I believe, as five-year-old, be falling victims to this crackdown. And we are also talking about extremely brutal threat tactics that the military had employed until now, uh, mainly in uh, remote ethnic areas, but these tactics are now being deployed in uh, the Bama heartland of Myanmar and in urban areas, and of course are being broadcast on Facebook and uh, other social media. Um, making it known to um, most Myanmar people and also to the rest of the world how the Myanmar military uh, operates. So I think the, the, the protests have been underestimated and uh, the crackdown is uh, exacting a very high cost uh, to the protesters, of course, but also to the military in terms of any legitimacy it might have retained um, among part of the Myanmar population or, or, or abroad. Second, in terms of the why I think there, is, there has been miscalculation, I think it's, it's a, the, what is called the Civil Disobedience Movement, or CDM, which I believe is really a curveball that has been thrown to the military. Because most significantly, what you are seeing is part of the state dissociating itself from the military and refusing to collaborate with what is seen as an illegitimate military government. And so practically, since February 1, we've seen thousands of civil servants in the health ministry, education ministry, information ministry, energy ministry, etc., walk away from their roles and refuse to work. Um, I think most prominently, uh, known to an international audience is uh, what has happened within the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with Ambassador to the United Nations in New York, Joe Motoun, uh, to the surprise of everybody um, during a meeting, making a speech announcing that he was joining the, the, the uh, that he was uh, defecting uh, de facto from uh, the, the military government to join uh, the, the other side. But so really this CDM is affecting the ability of SAC, of the military to govern. You are also seeing some local ward and village offices, um, which uh, really uh, administer uh, the government locally, uh, not being able to function because people uh, old, um, officers are being removed and new ones refuse to take their new roles because they do not want to be associated with SAC. Um, and the CDM is driven by various tactics. It's, uh, you have uh, people who, who are civil servants who just don't, you know, who just don't want to work uh, with uh, SAC for moral uh, reasons. You also have a, a very strong naming and shaming um, activities undertaken by Myanmar citizens online, offline. Um, you also have a fundraising that is happening to sustain the CDM. You have safe houses that are being provided to uh, protect some of these uh, civil servants. So really uh, an underground resistance movement with links throughout Myanmar 
and uh, abroad uh, that is gaining uh, a lot of strength daily despite the violent crackdown of the military. Um, as part of the CDM, but not uh, relating necessarily uh, to the civil service, you have uh, strikes. Uh, so for example, a lot of employees at banks are uh, refusing to work. And so the, the banking sector is uh, not working as usual, uh, deeply affecting the economy and the business environment, as an example. One last thing I will mention as to why I think the military has miscalculated um, and uh, underestimated the pushback, the reaction to its coup, is what is happening with the ethnic armed groups um, or ethnic armed organizations, EAOs, as they are uh, called in uh, Myanmar lingo. Um, what you saw uh, after February 1 is an attempt by SAC to conquer and divide or to, um, to try to buy off the EAOs by uh, stating that it would resume the peace process, that it would provide some concessions uh, to them, that it would be a better partner to the EAOs than the NLD government had been. Uh, and some of the EAOs uh, went for it at first. Uh, for example, the Arakan army, uh, which is a relatively new and relatively small but impactful um, ethnic insurgency uh, in northern Rakhine state on the border with Bangladesh, which the Myanmar military has been unable to uh, militarily defeat uh, in recent years. And so uh, you saw the, the military uh, try to give uh, uh, seats in, in its administration to prominent Rakhine politicians, Another prominent Rakhine politician was released from prison. And so the, this attempt to buy off uh, the support of the Arakan army and other EAOs. However, these attempts have faltered uh, over the weeks as um, the protests and the CDM have grown in, in, in the Bama heartland and beyond. And, EAO, and EAOs have uh, increasingly decided to align themselves with uh, this uh, domestic resistance movement, especially as um, this uh, resistance movement now has um, a key representative, a key body representing it, which is called the CRPH, Committee Representing the Pidu Ludo, and that consists of a number of uh, NLD members of parliament who should have taken their seats on February 1. Many of them are now in hiding. Some of them might be outside of the country. Um, but uh, in any case, they are communicating, uh, coming up with statements and trying to negotiate with the EAOs and all civil society organizations and all the parts of Myanmar society to present a united front against uh, SAC and also uh, to seek legitimacy internationally as a counter-government to uh, SAC. So even starting on February 1, which were driven by institutional reasons and personal ambitions, uh, however, um, a move that uh, has been uh, swatted uh, by uh, the protest movement, the CDM, the rise of uh, uh, an influential resistance movement. Uh, so where are we at now? Well, we are really in a quagmire and in a deadlock, a very dangerous deadlock. On one hand, you have the, the military uh, SAC, Minong Line, um, sticking to the plan at whatever cost it takes. So again, more than 500 deaths to date, and uh, it's unlikely to stop soon. The military is trying to bulldoze its way through Myanmar society and Myanmar economy in order to implement its roadmap towards what they call a return to uh, disciplined democracy. So that's on, on one side. On the other side, you have a, a resistance movement 
led by CRPH with the EAOs increasingly involved, uh, a lot of support uh, domestically, tremendous support domestically across social and economic classes, across ethnic groups. And this movement is now asking for the dismantlement of the military and the end of the uh, political experiment started under the 2008 constitution. Basically, they want a revolution at whatever the cost. And many individuals involved in this movement are now uh, preparing to resort increasingly to violent means, sabotage, acquiring weapons, being trained by EAOs in some remote areas to potentially bring uh, to uh, the center of the country uh, insurgency techniques to fight the military uh, by force. So really a radicalization on both sides of the political spectrum and little if any room left for moderates to try to find a compromised solution to uh, the crisis. Internationally, and I'll, I'll conclude with that, internationally you see, uh, unsurprisingly, a very divided landscape. The, the West, um, including the US, the EU, Australia, Canada, is uh, resorting to sanctions ranking them up progressively. The sanctions started as being very targeted against uh, uh, Minong Line's family, for example, but now uh, we have moved to um, uh, military companies being targeted. And I, I assess the list of entities and individual sanction is going to grow. I think it's unavoidable given the situation on the ground. And that will have an impact on the economy, the ability of foreign investors to to, to do business in Myanmar and the rest. So really the West resorting to sanctions, uh, not, uh, I mean, criticizing very uh, heavily um, SAC, et cetera. Um, in, then you see uh, countries like uh, Japan, South Korea, which have a significant business uh, and economic and geopolitical interest uh, in uh, uh, Myanmar, especially Japan, trying to remain pro-engagement and uh, try, you know, staying away from sanctions. But uh, de facto, uh, what I see is that these countries are becoming increasingly um, aligned with the West and increasingly unable to engage with SAC. And uh, this is having a growing impact on uh, what their companies or aid agencies can and cannot do in Myanmar. Then you have big nations like uh, India and China, which have borders with uh, Myanmar and which have uh, invested um, heavily in the relationship with the Myanmar military and which are um, really in a wait and see attitude uh, at the moment. You also have Russia, which is an important weapon provider to uh, Myanmar which has sent a delegation uh, over the weekend, you know, with people asking whether Russia could play a role like it has done in Syria. And last but not least, ASEAN, which uh, among a divided international community is uh, itself divided internally, with on one side maritime Southeast Asian nations, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, seeking to uh, push the uh, organization to action. And then on the other side, Vietnam or Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, of course, uh, also in a wait and see uh, position. And so really, I think uh, we should be concerned uh, of where things are, but most importantly, of where the situation is going in Myanmar. I, I will exaggerate on purpose, but uh, in, on purpose, but I think it's important to realistically look at the dynamics, the facts on the ground, and where it's leading us. I think on, on, we could see potentially a Syria 
Libya-like scenario with a, a military that uh, retains control over its uh, forces, but does not uh, hold most of it, uh, a lot of its territory with the EAOs and uh, some Bama opposition forces uh, waging a sustained conflict uh, on the ground in, uh, in, uh, in Myanmar within Southeast Asia. That's Syria in Southeast Asia, very concerning. We are not there yet, but uh, there is a clearly a possibility that we get to that stage. Another scenario is a North Korea-like scenario where the military, in order to impose its plan, bulldoze its plan for Myanmar society and economy, um, goes all in with violence, um, maybe uh, uh, has to nationalize or take control over part of the economy and uh, internet connections with uh, the outside world, etc., etc. Really, Myanmar becoming again a hermit and paria country because this is uh, to the benefits of the military and some of its uh, senior leadership. I truly hope, I truly hope there is a third way, a third way whereby um, there can be some dialogue, some compromise with moderate forces within the military and within the resistance movement, and whereby uh, the gains of the last 10 years that Myanmar has experienced, whether it's in terms of uh, foreign investment or in terms of democratization and the, the growth of uh, an independent media, etc. I really hope that there is a third way where these gains can be protected and a compromise can be found. But what is clear is that the longer the international community fails to respond in a coordinated manner to what is happening on the ground in Myanmar, the more difficult such a third way uh, it would be to find. Thank you. I look forward to addressing your sections later, your questions later. John, over to you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Victor, and thank you, Roma, for that uh, excellent uh, summary, or rather painful summary. Um, I just have very few slides uh, to focus attention. So, so first of all, by, uh, by way of introduction, I work for Control Risks. Many of you know Control Risks. We're a business risk consultancy. I'm based in Singapore. I'm part of an interdisciplinary team working very closely with our clients in Myanmar, which is taking up most of my waking hours at the moment. Um, I, in, in, in my work, I have a kind of portfolio. I work thematically on responsible business, business and human rights, business and anti-corruption. I've also been, have a geographical interest in Myanmar, which goes back to the 1990s. Uh, and, and, and therefore, I can offer, as well as an intense view of what is going on now, a bit of long-term perspective. Uh, I just wanted to start, and next slide, please, um, by introducing a little bit of that long-term perspective, which to some extent reinforces what Rama has just been saying. So I've been looking back at uh, what I wrote 25, nearly 30 years ago. And it's very striking that many of the things I wrote then and many of the issues are still there. So I've listed on the, on, on, on the left-hand side some of the fundamental issues which in the long term any Myanmar government needs to address and which will determine the environment for both domestic and international business. The first one is about national governance, so democracy, as Romain has been saying. The second one is also fundamental, both locally, nationally, and internationally. It is the ethnic groups, armed or not armed. Um, they constitute um, maybe a third of the population, maybe as much as 40%, depending on how you measure it, of, of, of the national territory. So how do they fit into the future 
union or federal government of Myanmar or whatever kind of state we see. And then critically, the army. So the army uh, has been in power, as Romain has said, it is uh, forged or created a constitutional role for itself, but it's not just about constitutions, it's about institutional and personal economic interests. And that then leads on to the whole question about equitable economic development. So I mean, does that mean these are long-term, they're intractable problems? Does that mean that uh, what is happening in Myanmar is uh, just what always happens in Myanmar? Um, and my answer for that is no. Uh, and, and, and here I want to, again, reinforce uh, Romain's point about, about what is different and about why now and, and, and also what now. The, the picture I took on the right, it's in provincial Myanmar, it's in 2013. You may not be able to see very well, but there's a point to the picture. It's a market scene. One of the points to the picture, especially then, was the satellite dishes. Suddenly, quite suddenly, 2012, 2013, satellite dishes sprouted up all over Myanmar, a bit like mushrooms after the rain. And what I'm picking up on there is that Myanmar isn't an isolated country. It's actually quite hard to see it becoming North Korea. Not that the military won't try or may not try, but it's connected. It's connected internally and externally through communications. The second thing is the, 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 the when we think about past um, eras, we think especially now about 1988, uh, about this disturbances then, which led to Aung San Suu Kyi coming to prominence, when I should remind you, hundreds but probably thousands of people were killed. A key difference between then and now is that people have experienced another form of government. And uh, not only they've experienced it, they've lived it. Um, I've been saying for the last 10 years, we may be optimistic about Myanmar, but remember, lack of education, lack of capacity, well, we've had 10 years of capacity building. We've had 10 years of improved education. We've also had many years already before that when um, Myanmar people have personally traveled. We see them here on the streets of Singapore. There, there, there is a wider vision of, 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 of the outside world. So, so, so summing up this point, Roman talks about revolution. In the world when revolutions happen, it's not necessarily when things are getting worse. It may be when things are getting better, but then they're thwarted, when hopes are rising, but they're disappointed. That's what's happening now. And also in relation to the point about travel, the people who have not been traveling are the soldiers. The top leadership may have been traveling, limited diplomatic mission, missions, but basically their, their worldview is a narrow worldview which hasn't changed. Fundamentally, they're stuck on the same agenda which they had in the, in the 80s and the 90s, disciplined democracy, guided democracy, controlled democracy. That world has moved on. They haven't moved on. This is where the clash is. Next slide, please. So, so now, what about, what about business? So, so here's the core of my presentation. For, for, for first, a bit of context. Um, just recently in the last week, the World Bank brought out uh, an optimistic assessment, which is of 10% contraction in the economy. That has to be optimistic. Uh, I wish it were only 10% for the coming year, that is. We also shouldn't forget COVID. Nobody's talking about COVID, but it's there. Nobody's measuring it. It must be there. But Nobody's talking about it because we're all dealing with a much more fundamental, much more attention grabbing crisis. So where are our clients? What are they thinking about? What are they worrying about? I think, I th I think Victor made a point about different sectors. Uh, the story is different um, for different sectors. That's also true of the long term, but broadly the issues I've summarized here. First of all, and very critically, it's duty of care. Many of our clients, in fact, because of COVID, they were already in some kind of crisis or different management mode. The ones who could are uh, often working at home, but they're worried whether they're working at home or trying to work in the offices or working in factories, 
they're, they're worried about their people. Um, there is a concern about um, people, especially in the, in the early stages, but also now who, 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 who were taking part in demonstrations. It was their right to take part in demonstrations. There is a concern about welfare. This is not um, a crisis which is happening in remote places. Uh, it's happening in places where all of us who've been to Myanmar or lived in Myanmar, as Rima has, they're places we know. They're also people we know. Uh, if uh, Chains of connection. If we ourselves don't know somebody who's been caught up in the crisis through a personal tragedy, we certainly know people who know people. It's, it's close, it's personal. So the second issue has been keeping the business going, and that's really hard. Um, to emphasize, again, um, Rama worked brief, referred briefly to the banks. Many of the banks uh, have not been functioning to the extent that they are functioning. Um, they're hobbled. People have been on strike. They haven't been turning up for work. The military or the central bank of Myanmar is trying to force them to turn up to work. The central bank, for example, is levying fines on banks who, who, who don't open their branches. Um, the banking system is functioning, but barely. So last month, there were real difficulties in paying people because the cash wasn't available. Uh, this month, I think it may be slightly better, but only slightly better. So that's, uh, a, again, a fundamental issue. Another question is about the ports. Uh, one of our clients works in fast moving goods. Nothing is moving fast. Many of the goods um, which he wanted to, which they wanted to import are stuck at the ports. They're paying demurrage, paying a fine because they're stuck, um, which is probably already greater than the value of the goods that are stuck. Um, that then leads to this, this, this really difficult question about can they be neutral? So um, one quite um, carefully word statement, which was issued by a group of companies in mid-February, coordinated by the Myanmar Center for Responsible Business. It was a um, carefully phrased statement about we are companies who are committed to Myanmar. We abide by international standards. Uh, including, for example, standards on human rights and on anti-corruption and on the ILO rights on labor. We believe in Myanmar. We are looking for a peaceful Myanmar and that, and, and, and that requires a political resolution. That was a measured statement. I, I think it's fair to say that the SAC wouldn't have liked it. But now companies are facing even more acute dilemmas. For example, do, do they pay taxes? And if so, if so how and when? Um, Rama referred to the CRPH. This is the alternative government. Tomorrow, there, there are plans actually to announce its government and, and, and ministers. These are MPs who have been elected. They have issued a statement suspending tax payments until, uh, and, 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 until September. What do companies do in that situation? Many of their employees are saying to management, don't pay taxes. The CRPH, which is legitimate, is saying, don't do so. Why should you do so? For now, it's possible to prevaricate when the banks are not working anyway. It's quite difficult to pay taxes. It's also quite complex. Um, but can you prevaricate indefinitely? Then um, thinking about the future, what actually can we think about? So. Um, before I get to that, I, 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 I just want to pick up on sanctions. As Roman said, the sanctions started by being targeted against individuals by the commander in chief and his family, so, so named individuals and their business interests. Um, this is on the part of the US, UK, EU, um, Canada, not yet Australia, although Australia has individuals named. Since last week, since Thursday, the United States and UK have been targeting the military conglomerates, 
which are broad conglomerates. Uh, the Miyawadi Bank, which is owned by Myanmar Economic Holdings, a military owned conglomerate, is one of the largest banks. Um, this actually is, the sanctions are new, but the focus on banks is not new. Many leading, I should say, Western international companies had already been seeking to minimize formal business relationships with those companies anyway, and particularly since 2019, following the publication of a UN report on the economic interests of the military. So, so, so the issue isn't new, but the intensity is new, and there will be repercussions. So, for example, last Thursday, immediately after these sanctions were announced, I was having a discussion with a international bank. Um, they had a question, which is, how easy is it to do due diligence in Myanmar? So I sort of said, well, we do it all the time and this is what you need to do. But, but then he elaborated on the how easy. I, I mean, he, he didn't want a complicated answer. He wanted an easy answer. Basically, his point was that as a bank, he's the head of sanctions in the bank. They're going to scrutinize all financial uh, transactions with Myanmar. If they can't find easy answers, they're simply going to say, well, don't touch it. It's easier to say, halt the transaction rather than to um, consider detailed due diligence. Another point, um, which may be a sign of things to come, on Monday, the UK, the, the US announced uh, a suspension of a, a trade, specifically it was something called the Trade and Investment Framework Agreement signed in 2013. It requires um, conversations between US and Myanmar government officials. It's easy to understand that um, the US isn't in the mood to have conversations right now. So it's not surprising that this has been suspended, nevertheless a bad sign. What was also mentioned at the end of the statement from the U US trade representative was that Myanmar's GSP, generalized system of um, preferences, which is a trade agreement giving Myanmar exports certain privileges, was also coming up for renewal, and there would be hard questions. My, I mean, my current view is that there may be hard questions, but there would be a good reason for not suspending a GSP, or in the U EU case, anything but arms privileges, there would be good reasons for not doing it because the whole tenor of international policy is towards somehow targeted sanctions. But the point I'm making is that it would be more difficult to make that decision. And also that even targeted sanctions, the targets are getting broader and therefore the wider impact is also getting broader. So, 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 so then to my question about, um, dare we think about the future? So as I say, most of our conversations with our, our, our clients have been about hanging on, they've been about short term, but they have been saying, can we be here in six months time? And I've been saying, um, for example, to the fast moving goods company, well, I hope so. This is a personal global citizens view. I hope so, because you're providing goods that people need. You're providing, you're working in a sector which is not controversial. Why not? I'm saying that somewhat rhetorically, but unfortunately, there is a there are all sorts of business reasons why not. Uh, there, the, 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 there are questions about can you even function. So, if you cannot function, then then how long do you um, hang on? Um, another phrase from a client this week was bleeding money. We're bleeding money. Do we stay? Um, that conversation was also about. But if we if we announce that we're going, do we put our people under risk, at, at, at risk? Are they, for example, going to be summoned in for questioning to explain the, the decision? So um, next slide, please. So that um, takes us into um, views about, about the future. Like everybody else, um, we're thinking about scenarios where um, challenged scenarios are not predictions. Uh, just quickly, this picture is of a, of a taxi driver seeing the road ahead. Um, 
that picture was taken last year. It couldn't be taken this year because he has lots of NOD, Aung San Suu Kyi paraphernalia, uh, and he would be at risk of arrest or worse if he displayed those now. But um, looking, looking at our, our scenarios, we currently have unfinished coup, which is basically where we are now. Uh, it is clear, as Roman has said, that the military's plans are thwarted, it's stuck, there is a deadlock. It's a deadly deadlock, but it's sort of within the military's plans, it's calculated. A, um, a, a deeper version to this is, is all in, no holds barred. It's an escalation of violence on both sides. Uh, as Romain said, on the opposition side, people are, are saying, look, we need to defend ourselves. There is talk about sabotage. The, 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 there is talk about alliances with ethnic armed groups. Uh, that, 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 that is a worse version um, where, again, echoing a conversation with a client, are we there now? We think not yet. But the phrases that were coming up were edging, gliding, slipping towards that scenario. The third one is, 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 is straining the imagination. They called it catastrophe or, or, or compromise. We can, as Romain has said, we can get even worse. Um, I, 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 I do hesitate about Syria, but categorically we can get worse. So how could we avoid that? So the, 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 the phrase catastrophe, catastrophe or compromise, one of the billion chat, million or billion dollar questions is about the military leadership. I can't see the commander in chief resigning. I can imagine a palace coup. If we had a palace coup, would that open up a little room for um, some kind of political negotiation? Just possibly, but only just possibly. Nevertheless, I'm trying to imagine, I'm straining to imagine uh, a situation where having looked at an even worse scenario, which is all too credible, somebody finds a room for some kind of phased, um, phased negotiation. As Roman says, uh, international community is important. I've been saying it's not decisive in the sense that the current military leadership is not going to be guided by the, by the international community unless it sees fewer other options. It's possible, it's conceivable that if the alternative is an even bigger catastrophe, we're already in catastrophe, but an even bigger catastrophe, I could imagine, I hope to imagine some kind of maneuver to, to, towards a negotiating compromise. That is a strain but Myanmar has the capacity to supply us in bad ways, maybe, maybe in good ways. I really don't, and my, I guess my final points, um, we were saying uh, in our prep talk last week, I, I, I wanted to end on a not totally pessimistic note. Again, I'm struggling <laughs> not to end on a totally pessimistic note, but some final points. There are enduring strengths of the country, location, market, natural resources, people. Those people, I mentioned capacity building, they have built capacity, they have a vision of the future. There are new visions of the future. It, it, it's not just the NLD, the NLD had its own problems. There are new visions of the future. There is a world struggling to be born, a new kind of Myanmar struggling to be born. It really is a struggle. But in that future, I do think that business, responsible business, has a critical role to play. And in that sense, I really don't want to give up. That's a personal view. Um, and it's John Bray as global citizen, not John Bray as hard-nosed business analyst talking to individual companies. Those individual companies have really tough decisions to make, and they must take account of tough commercial realities as they make them. So that's my talk. Um, we look forward to questions and discussions. Well, thank you very much, um, Roma and uh, John. Um, that was 
the two very interesting presentations um, uh, filled with, on the one hand, um, concern, despair, and yet hope. Um, but what struck me as someone who has, um, you know, watched what's been going on in Myanmar for uh, nearly 40 years is why on earth was the coup really necessary, given the fact that the military dominates uh, the, the, the parliament and the political decision making process? I mean, this to me was the most astonishing thing of all. And the only thing that I could uh, I explain it was there must be real personal animosity going on between uh, Aung San Suu Kyi on the one hand and the commander in chief on the other. You know, would you agree that rather than purely institutional reasons, it was that personal uh, animosity or non-relationship that led to February the 1st? I, 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 shall I try and, and, and remember, um, I would say the personal thing is critical. So mm. to Myanmar, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the, and the commander in chief weren't talking to each other. Uh, that, that, that's clearly a mistake. I, I, I also think that the decision was taken by a small group of people with limited horizons. Uh, the rest of the world wasn't fundamentally expecting it for the reasons you give. And, 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 and the way it has turned out mean that they trying to put ourselves in our shoes, in, in the general shoes, we wouldn't have done that. We would have been right not to do it. I, I mean, having said that, um, I don't think we should completely discount other opinions. Strange things do happen in elections. And, and I'm even thinking about the UK elections. I, 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 again, it's a bit of a stretch um, and it may not make much sense in Singapore, but the Liberal Party before our latest UK elections was expecting to play a much more important role than it actually did play. And, and, and then the leader lost her seats. So, 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 so I don't think it was just the generals who, who were in a different world. I think some of the people on their side also were in a different world. Um, but I, I, I guess the question also has another angle, which is there is a small group of people. Well, what about the people under them? And, and I, I'm still saying this is the million or billion chat question. What, what, what happens to the military as an institution? There is no sign of anything, no actual sign of anything happening other than the military staying together. I can't see any clear indicator, but there is a lot of supposition, which is more than plausible supposition. There must be people in the military who are feeling the pain, the personal pain, um, but there's a lot of fear about doing anything about it. Yeah. Roma, have you anything you would like to add? Yeah, I mean, uh, obviously, the, the relationship uh, between uh, Minong Line and Aung San Suu Kyi was quasi-inexistent and completely broke down. However, I think it's important to uh, look at what happened also from the perspective of the NLD and of Aung San Suu Kyi. I mean, you know, I'm, no, I'm not naive and I know that she had her failings, but I think her and the NLD party, um, to their credit, they accepted to take part in the national reconciliation process, mm -hmm. which was guided by the military. They went very far, very far in aligning with the military interests, including uh, during the Rohingya crisis, right? And actually what the, the, le the extent to which uh, Aung San Suu Kyi and the NLD aligned with the interest of the military then, is going to make it very difficult for part of the international community to now turn around and uh, give, give them support again. But really, and I think you know that's why, Victor, you are so surprised, and I was surprised, and many others were surprised because, yes, it was not perfect. And I, but you know, really, the core interests of the military had not been uh, put in danger. Mm. But maybe the question there as an institution was, until when? Mm. And I think, you know, there was, I think fundamentally there was a divergence in view, I think for the NLD and, and the Myanmar population, uh, all in all. The, the idea was that, well, the military has started to give up uh, political power, and this is a trend that will continue. It's a natural way of things. Mm -hmm. They might retain their bunkers in Nepido and the control over the military and 
their jade concessions and all of that, and we look the other way, and that's a price to pay, and we are ready to pay that price, and we are also ready to pay the price of impunity. Because mm. again, I mean, Oksan Suchi and the people in the NLD, they were tortured, they were arrested, some of their people died. So again, I think from a very personal perspective, and I think that's what is amazing about Myanmar and some of its people sometimes, it's the degree to which they are ready to forgive and look ahead. So maybe there is hope there. But anyway, I think at the same time, it's important to keep that in mind um, because, and I'll conclude on that, since the coup, especially the first weeks after the coup, I heard a lot of um, voices which put the blame of what happened on the NLD. Mm. Right, like, uh, oh, they mismanaged the country, the economy was not moving forward, they pushed too hard against the military. And I think it's important to consider this, um, this uh, criticism uh, and to look at them factually, including the, the fraud allegation. And I mean, you know, if, if, there are, uh, if there have been issues with certain polls, all right, let, let's look at that. But again, what the military has done and, and the fact that it expected people to go along with it shows the degree to which they are isolated. And there is clear, they are clearly, and I think, you know, we can speculate, we don't know exactly, uh, I mean, no one really knows what's happening inside the, at the top pyramid of the military. But what is clear is that in order to maintain their control over the country as of now, and to keep moving ahead with their agenda, the costs and the threats are mounting. The amount of people who have been detained, released, some detained again, the number of people who are under official or unofficial house arrest, it's tremendous. I'll tell you, I mean, I, I have many examples to give. I do uh, work in Myanmar for uh, foreign investors. I have a lot of contacts there. But just as an example, um, I know of a very powerful tycoon extremely powerful tycoon who basically cannot leave the country, does not trust his uh, personal security officers who are around him but knows that they might be actually not protecting him but watching him on behalf of the people in Nepido. He, you know, and has very tough choices to make. Like uh, how much do I force my employees to return to work because the stack is pressuring me to do so, but at the same time, that's going to affect my uh, corporate and personal standing and reputation with the people of Myanmar who are telling me not to do that. Very tough choices for some of these people. And again, I think, you know, the longer this goes on, the, the, the more reduced the circle of people around Minong Line and the top leadership becomes. And the more the cost of being part of that group become uh, visible. Again, will people will, will they dissociate themselves and an internal coup, uh, very unlikely, very difficult to predict. But in my opinion, what is clear is that coming out of this crisis, whatever the way, the support to the military will have decreased tremendously and the institution will be in a very precarious situation. They might hold the guns, they might hold the, the, the actual power, but I think oh, oh, uh, most of its legitimacy is that it had managed to protect through some type of uh, the Rohingya and, and some type of, of um, propaganda. I think this is gone. As John said, the Myanmar, it's like two worlds colliding, right? You have people in Nepido reading the new light of Myanmar and doing the parade on Saturday. Mm -hmm. And then you have the rest of the Myanmar people including the tycoons, including uh, uh, family members of military who are watching Facebook and looking at people being shot, more than 100 of them on Saturday. And those are the two worlds that collide. And I think this, it's the world in Nepido that is going to shrink, not the world outside of Nepido. And, and you know, maybe in a, in a, in a real sense, um, this almost, had to happen for that prestige of the army to be uh, as undermined as you suggest it now is. Um, and, and maybe there is that hope that they've gone too far. And as you both sort of commented, they, they miscalculated. But bringing this back to businesses, 
I mean, how does a business get through this? You can't pay your staff. Um, your staff don't turn up for work because they're on strike. Um, on the other hand, you're being pushed by the military authorities to keep your premises and places of work open. And I've heard quite a few stories of pressure being placed on um, uh, businesses owned by me and my nationals, as well as businesses owned by uh, and run by foreign investors, foreign business people. Um, I mean, how, what, what are your, your contacts telling you? How are businesses managing through this? It's really tough. I guess, again, we both have views on it, um, but it is, it is day by day and, and, and it's week by week. Uh, it does involve listening to the employees. Um, it does involve um, keeping things going where you can. And, and, and that, 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 again, it's partly why I mentioned fast moving consumer goods. These, the, these are things that people need. Um, so you're in an easier position if you're if you're in those kinds of sectors, um, I, I, I mean, sector does matter, but frankly, it is day by day uh, and and week by week. And I guess we have to be quite. We have to acknowledge that the six month question is not an easy question. Um, even the companies, the international companies that primarily who I'm thinking about, yeah. who, who want to be in Myanmar are, are really asking whether they can be. I think, I, I mean, in practice, the, we're not seeing that many outright withdrawals yet. Yeah. Um, we, we control risks. We had some conversations which came to an abrupt stop on February the 1st um, of, of, about people who wanted to go in. Oddly enough, we have had a handful of conversations with people who had deals they really wanted to, to, to go through. Um, somewhat surprisingly, but, but we have had those conversations. Um, probably the majority view is um, you can't but be sl slowing down, uh, but, 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 but hanging on for now. Indeed, and of course, as you say, it, it, it is early. So which sectors are most negatively impacted? Because you stressed in your presentation and in your comments a few moments ago that it does matter what sector uh, your business is in. So if you're not in fast moving consumer goods, uh, what, what are those sectors that are feeling this most seriously? Well, I, I, I mean, anything, and quite a lot of the Myanmar economy um, is affected by the suspension of mobile phone data. So, so, so that's not just international companies, it's also small companies. Yeah. Um, that int it, incidentally is, um, a kind of question about uh, so it illustrates very clearly the military's priority is security it makes sense from that point of view to shut down mobile data but if they want to present business and usual as usual they have to seriously think about opening that up um at some point governments um governments now here's a contrast with the 90s uh, so the international campaign groups were saying we don't want anything jeans shirts whatever made in myanmar now they're saying we will actively campaign against um, suspension of garment imports. Um, but nonetheless, H&M has said it is suspending because we can't guarantee supplies. Mm -hmm. um, oil and gas is in a really difficult strategic position. They have to make long-term decisions because of the nature of their investment cycle. They are under pressure, so the question about taxes uh, applies to them, but on a much larger scale. Um, no easy way out for them unless the UN takes the decision for them, UN sanctions, and, and, and right now we don't see that. So they politically are very much stuck between a rock and the hard place. That cliche about the rock and the hard place applies one way or another to, to everyone, including us, as, as Roman has said, the, the tycoon. So, so on, I mean, on that point, on our reputational due diligence, we were looking at some of these tycoons, a classic question for an international mm -hmm. community, was this tycoon made his money under the previous regime? Are they sufficiently reformed? Do we trust them? Um, ironically, those same people uh, are, 
ironically, or the twist of, in terms of history, um, those same people are feeling pressure from, 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 from this regime and, and, and are really, really caught. I'm sure Romain has lots to add. Yeah, thank, yeah, thank you, John. I think it's a great picture. And uh, maybe I'll talk about uh, the view from Japan. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, even though I know you, you, uh, you guys at Control Risk do a lot of great work with uh, Japanese clients. But um, really, I think, I mean, there have been some exits. I mean, in Japan, uh, prominently uh, Kirin, even though I mean, it's in the public domain, they announced they, were uh, they want to exit their joint venture with uh, now US sanctioned military conglomerate EMEHL yeah. uh, into Myanmar beer. But they had said, and that's back in February, that they wanted to remain in the market in some way or another, could have been soft drinks or, I mean, but really on exit, what I see talking to people on the ground in, um, in Yangon is uh, you, you have uh, all the smaller operators that exit discreetly. So for example, I have a contact who told me how he was uh, helping, um, let's say, a manufacturer do a discount sale on all the equipment and the goods that had been produced that were in stock because they are just going for the exit and trying to recoup losses as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think, you know, there is, this, there is some of that happening. I see uh, some uh, businesses, including Japanese businesses, uh, adopting the ostrich strategy. It's basic, like, I mean, I have had this conversation where people tell me in Tokyo, people tell me, oh, our people in Yangon tell us that it will be fine. It will be back to normal after Tinjin which is a water festival, which is mid-April, right? Mm. And basically, you have this idea that uh, the military will try to bring things back in order by uh, Armed Forces Day last Saturday, where well, clearly that didn't work out. And so now the new uh, uh, deadline will be uh, Tinjan in, in a month and a half from now. But what does normal mean? And I think, you know, there is an interesting question in the Q&A, which is what happens if the military kill on San Suu Kyi and her parties? Mm. And I, I, so... I don't, I don't think they will do that, and I don't think that will happen. But what is clear is that there is no return to political normalcy as long as Aung San Suu Kyi and others around her are under house arrest. I, I just think it's unacceptable for many people now involved in the opposition movement. So how do you get out of this quagmire and actually return to normal in a month and a half from now? I just think that's... that's uh, but anyway, that's interesting to see how headquarters here in Tokyo, and I'm sure the places just have sometime limited information, accurate information on what's happening. And that brings me to my, maybe my last point around businesses. I think especially uh, uh, Japanese businesses, uh, and I'd be curious to, to know what, what, how Singapore businesses think, but uh, they watch very carefully what their government does. Mm -hmm. And the Japanese government has been very cautious uh, until recently, and they continue, you know, like no sanctions. Uh, and I think I understand working, you know, uh, behind the curtain, being discreet in its, uh, how it applies pressure or tries to uh, um, incentivize um, the, the military to turn, to change route. But I think it's yesterday, uh, Foreign Minister Motegi, the Prime Minister having oversight over JICA and uh, most of the uh, official development aid budget, which amounts to billions of dollars from Japan to Myanmar, which is probably one of the largest budgets uh, that Japan has in Asia or in the world. And uh, Prime Minister Motegi came out and declared that new ODA projects were frozen, mm -hmm. which is, you know, not a surprise, which had been known, uh, uh, this is well, not it was happening, but this became a statement. And I think, again, uh, 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 Japanese uh, officials, Asian officials, they operate somewhat differently on the diplomatic scene. They might not use a megaphone as much as their Western counterparts, but this type of words count. And I know through my client network here that also following on what happened over the weekend, again, more than 100 deaths on Saturday only countrywide, um, there, there are some reactions. There are some reactions, and I think the messages shared by the Japanese government and other governments having an impact on their businesses is changing. Um, yeah, so no, no, no return, uh, no return to business uh, as usual uh, after uh, after Tinjan, That's for sure. 
here, I agree. Uh, they're just turning to the, the other questions in the Q&A box. Um, there's a number really around two things, the um, efficacy of sanctions on the one hand, um, and you know the international community, which we all know does not really exist. It's a series of nation states looking after their own interests and sometimes acting in concert and sometimes not. So beyond the sort of uh, economic sanctions and the words of condemnation, I mean, what really can um, the rest of the world do about the situation in Myanmar? And what are the implications for ASEAN? Because we've seen um, Singapore support the president of Indonesia's call for a conference on Myanmar, which for ASEAN is a very big step because uh, the, the charter really clearly states non-interference in members internal affairs. So what, what are your views on, on the quote unquote international community and the effectiveness of sanctions? Shall I, shall I again start and, uh, and Roman continues if, if that's okay. Um, so, 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 so on sanctions, we've been there before, there, there is a view that they should be targeted, mm. but they're already having a broader impact on the economy. Um, I, 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 I guess my summary view is, is, is that the regime, again, as I've said, it listens to the international community when it wants to, um, when it feels it has to. I'm not sure that it's got to that point yet. I think on the streets of Myanmar, there is frustration. Um, they're saying how many people have to die before the international community does something. And, and, and then what is happening in the outside world is, is that things are moving at a different pace. That's true, but fundamentally of all of us. I, let's say of all the countries concerned, um, I guess it's especially true of ASEAN trying to put together some kind of consensus. There, again, last week I was having a, a, a kind of scenario discussion about what, what could push things forward. CRPH is, is, is important. Um, so to the extent uh, it's making a presentation and send to the UN Security Council in the next few days. To, so, so the extent to which it can establish its credibility as an alternative government in waiting, not just in waiting there, mm. that, that will make a difference. Um, ASEAN would make a difference. Um, so, so the UN Security Council is saying, we're looking to see what ASEAN is going to say <laughs> the, the, it's, it's not so much buck passing. Um, it's really helpful for the Security Council if ASEAN does say something, and the other way around as well. So, so, so it's a kind of conversation. China, we've, we and we scarcely mentioned China um, early in the coup. There were suggestions that China was behind it or, or, or had advance notice. It's very clear that the coup is not in China's interests uh, and, and, and could rebound on it. Um, that doesn't necessarily go as far as an official condemnation. But now we have Russia. Uh, Russia has made its appearance on Saturday, um, uh, frankly, as part of its wider international maneuvering. Mm. Um, Myanmar is a pawn on its chessboard, yeah. uh, and, and the chessboard is beyond this region. Um, it's going to be very hard to get an international consensus, which includes both Russia and China and ASEAN. But if CRPH can get its, establish its credibility, if ASEAN can develop a degree of consensus, and especially what happens on the ground, maybe um, there could be some move towards a greater consensus. And, and I guess, I mean, my summary, maybe I'm talking too much, but my summary is um, what happens on the ground is always the most important. What people on the ground think is what is, is the most important, but they are interconnected. Um, so it's, it's, it's simply not true just to say this is a Myanmar internal problem. It's not a, just a Myanmar internal problem. Myanmar is connected with the rest of the world 
um, even if, if it, people might wish it not to be. Yeah, and especially since um, there has been very significant foreign investment in the last uh, 10, 15 years. Uh, so you're absolutely right. The, 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 the line of what is strictly an internal uh, affair or issue is, is really blurred. Roman, uh, would you like to offer some thoughts? Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, John. Thank you, Victor. I, I'll be brief. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I'll be brief and I'll be blunt. I think uh, the world doesn't wanted another uh, crisis. And Myanmar is seen as a distraction. Mm. I mean, you have China and US, I mean, so many other COVID. And so I think to put it bluntly, a lot of people thought on February 1 that it's not good, but we can live with it. Mm. I mean, you know, it's like, like Thailand or, you know, they, we can live with this regime. It's another authoritarian regime that maybe delivers uh, technocratically, we, we can live with it. And I think it's really the events on the ground which, are, which have completely uh, made that plan impossible. And I think this is, and, and because the events on the ground show no sign of moving towards a, a resolution, my assessment is that the West will increasingly uh, have to switch morally and uh, for political reasons toward the hard sanction stance, san uh, some sanction targeted, but also you know, politically some recognition to CRPH. I think we are moving towards that mm -hmm. with the repercussion on the key Asian partners, Japan, South Korea, and pressure put to bear on ASEAN. I'm starting to hear questions as, I mean, so the big question is in November, if there is an ASEAN meeting with Biden, I mean, will Myanmar take part in that summit? Mm. Or what will be the status of, of uh, Myanmar within ASEAN at the time? And before that big summit, there are a lot of ASEAN meetings where Myanmar is represented before. And the question is increasingly being asked, is it okay to have a Myanmar counterpart there while actually the legitimate person is in jail? And I think you know this question will become increasingly asked and whether maybe ASEAN doesn't want to act or cannot act, but I think because of the pressure, it's going to, to lead to action. And I'll conclude by saying, by addressing the question around economic sanctions don't work. Yes, economic sanctions by themselves don't work. And uh, when, you, when you are in North Korea, even coordinated global uh, UN economic sanctions don't work. Okay, understood. But I think my assessment, my view is that the Myanmar generals don't want to be North Korea. They want to have international legitimacy. They want to retain a role in ASEAN and they think that they can get away with, uh, with their coup or they thought that they could. And I think that it will become increasingly clear that they know there is no return to normal after Tinjan. It's not business as usual and it's not like Tencent 2.0. And so as a result, I, I think that uh, there is a bit of hope in that the mix of uh, uh, Western pressure and uh, uh, Asian engagement because of circumstances on the ground come together to try to, to create some, top, some type of compromise. Let's hope. Thank you. Finally, because we're running out of time, can I ask both of you just to give your, your sort of top advice to businesses right now coping with what's happening in Myanmar and thinking about how they should respond. What would be your key words of advice to those businesses? <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll start uh, this time, John. If you, and uh, really, I think be informed. And the way to be informed is by listening to different voices. I know that they are I know that there are a lot of advisors who are again saying, you know, it's about like 50, 50 percent chance. And, you know, uh, it's good. The military is so strong. They just, just hold power. And maybe it's true in some way. But I think given this unprecedented crisis, which is evolving very fast with a lot of stakeholders, I think it's essential to listen to different voices, including divergent ones, contrarian voices. Otherwise, you risk being in a bubble and not seeing the risks that are uh, emerging and rising around you as a business. 
And of course, that's not just true for Myanmar, that's true for nearly everything else in this world. John. Yeah, okay. so I, I, I was thinking, talk, listen to your Myanmar stuff, and but you do have a duty of care and, and you also have a source of information. I do think challenge yourself. You heard me struggling to challenge myself and thinking about six months or in a year's time. So how will your decision now look in a year's time? The reality of international business is um, that you do need to think not just about Myanmar, but how your business is seen internationally. That, that, that particularly applies if you have, if you do happen to have links with military conglomerates or, 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 or depending on um, the um, military in some way or another. And I guess I would put my, this is personal, not uh, rather like I ended my presentation. I would wish, I hesitate to put it as an advice, but I would wish that they can hang on. Thank you. Thank you both um, for your time and for sharing your insights and analyses with us today. Um, thanks too for the collaboration we've had between Control Risk and also IC's Yusuf Ishak Institute. And let me thank the audience for being um, uh, engaged and for some excellent questions on the international community angles, inverted commas, and sanctions, and um, the way forward. I mean, Myanmar has got to be um, the classic um, case where you've got reputational risk, you've got operational risk, you've got personal risk if you're working and living in Myanmar, and um, it is a very challenging time for business. But of course, nothing like as challenging for the, the people of Myanmar. So thank you so much for your time. We look forward to seeing uh, everybody again soon. And uh, from all of us at SICC, goodbye for now. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.